as I said, I feel that the class is doing well, so I, I want to escalate the level and push you a little bit more into theoretical aspects. Okay, I feel comfortable. Now, question I have to ask you is, do you need the MATLAB tutorial still? How many of you feel that you need a MATLAB tutorial either in class or recorded version? I feel that most of you are able to do well, and if there are a few, I can provide individual help if you want to drop by my office, or I can record more material like that and put it, but I'm not sure how many of you will actually go through it. I know people from outside the LSU are looking at these MATLAB. I've had some email from students far away, so uh, I might want to do that a little bit more as we go into other details, but I think basic tools that we need, particularly writing a function, calling a function to another function, dealing with arrays, the loop structures. These are the basic tools that we will need to solve all the remaining type of problems that we will encounter. So I feel comfortable uh, to let it at, go at this stage, but I need to, your feedback. How many of you still feel that you would benefit by having a tutorial outside of the class? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. How many of you would actually like to meet in a lab environment? More recording. How many of you would like more recording? Okay. So maybe we will do that. I will uh, do a few more recordings <laughs> of. MATLAB related issues and uh, put them up okay, uh, periodically, at least once a week, but uh, often maybe more. And if there are any particular topics that you want me to cover, send me by email. I will uh, put that into the tutorial. Okay. Um, so in the last lecture, currently we are looking at solving nonlinear algebraic equation. Okay. And I, what I'm going to do from now on, uh, not put so much emphasis on MATLAB related issues in the lecture, because I feel that uh, we have done enough, we have gained enough uh, technical tools, but I will give you snippets of codes that will solve various types of problems. What we need to do is learn about various types of mathematical models um, and how to solve that using MATLAB. And what is the algorithm, what is the theory behind these solvers that MATLAB uses? We have seen a solve, uh, we will see today F0, for example, and we have seen uh, F min search, we have seen ODE45, we are going to see DVP4C. Each one solves a different class of problems. The very first thing that you should be able to do is, given a problem, try to identify what kind of problem is it, what tool do I need, and then you would have gone through this example of setting it up in MATLAB and getting a solution. Okay? So we are now looking at the theory behind uh, how does this algorithm work? How does FSOL work? Okay? And not only FSOL, there are many, many algorithms for solving uh, a single nonlinear algebraic equation, and then we will extend that to a system of nonlinear algebraic equations. Now, these problems occur in many cases in chemical engineering. So we are taking the flash as one example. Okay? The reason I took flash, multi-component flash, is even though it results in a large number of equations, it is easy to eliminate all the intermediate variables and reduce it to a single nonlinear algebraic equation in a single variable. And that's what we did in one of the previous lectures, the so-called the rice rash word equation, which you will see in uh, later. So the only unknown here is psi, the k or the equilibrium ratios that are given, z is the feed composition that is given. We will learn how to set up the same problem in HISIS. HISIS is a very common process simulator chemical engineers use, and you will learn to use that. You will use it in a design course later on. So it's so easy to set it up, but in order, when it fails, when HISIS does not give you a result, a converged result, you need to understand what is convergence. What do we mean by convergence? Why, why, why doesn't it uh, converge? How, what can I do to uh, to make it converge? Those are the issues that we need to learn about by understanding 
how these algorithms work, how does FSOL work, how does HISIS solve these set of equations. <coughs> so, in the last lecture, we, uh, or a few lectures ago, we implemented this rice rashford equation into a function. That is something that we know that we need to do. A problem is unique to us, so we have to define what the problem is, whether it is to HISIS or to MATLAB or any other tool. There are tools in Excel that will solve a uh, nonlinear algebraic equation as well. So, in MATLAB, the way that we implement this is we identify what is the unknown and send that as an input to a function that we write, and that <coughs> function uses a rule for calculating that particular equation and sends out what is the function value. Okay. So, if you see there, there is the function value that is assigned on the left hand side of that, and you can map there is a sum here and there is a sum there. Okay. Term by term, all we are doing is we are translating this particular equation into the code that we have here. You can see k minus 1, well, 1 minus k, the protein sign can be there. And then z, we have a z, but we have a dot. This is where you need to understand the MATLAB syntax. So, the dot star says do an element by element multiplication, whether I have 2 components or 20 components in a feed stream, the same algorithm will work independent of the number of components. And then you have divide by 1 plus you see the one there, k minus 1 times sine. Okay? So, that equation is the MATLAB representation of the rice rashford equation. Before that, of course, we are setting up a few things. For example, we need to know what is the equilibrium ratio and the peak composition. These can be vectors, so we are passing them as global. And we are checking that they are the same length that k and z, the equilibrium ratios and the peak composition we must have the same number because that depends on the number of components that we have. So, if it is not there, somebody has made an error in input. So, you uh, print out and you should notice that when I put an error, it prints out the error and quits the function. Okay, whereas, put, if I put a f print f or display, it will display the same line, but it will continue on with the next. Okay, so that is an important difference between display f print f and error. An error says print out that error message and quit this function. Go back to wherever the call came from, from the workspace or from another uh, function. And here we are saying this function can calculate the unknown function not only for one value of psi, but a vector of values of psi. So I can spend, send 10 values of psi and it will calculate the function values for each one of them. So it will come out with the same vector length as psi that goes in. Then I can plot it if I like. Okay. So, this is the way that we define, I'm not sure what's happening here. Okay. Okay. So, this function will be called by FSOL or the functions that we have written. What I want to do in this lecture is explore some of the algorithms that we have written, bisect and regular false I are the two that we have seen. We are going to see secant and Newton method. Okay. And then we will use this example to compare and see uh, how the, each one of these functions uh, behave. Okay, so, in a MATLAB workspace, I declare, this is in the workspace, k and z to be global, and I initialize the feed composition, and so this is a four component system, the k values, k values are properties. Okay, and uh, first I am going to call, um, let me just actually do it, so that you see, okay, uh, global a and Z and uh, Z is equal to 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Because it is defined as mole fraction, they should add to 1. Okay? Uh, but our program is not going to check that. We could uh, build that if you like. And K is going to be equal to, I'm not sure what numbers I put in there, 2, 1.5.5. Okay, so I have defined, I have declared k and z to be global. I have defined their values. Now I can call any of the functions that I have built so far. I have built bisect and regular calls. Huh? If you remember, in the next exam, a significant part is going to be on algorithms and models. First was on MATLAB and models. Second one is going to be algorithms and models. So you should know the subtle differences between various methods that we use to solve for nonlinear algebraic equation. Okay? So, in the bisect method, we make a guess, two guesses, and then 
we say the third guess is halfway between. In the regular falsi, we take two guesses and we put a straight line through that and ask the question, where does the straight line intersect the x-axis? That is a better guess, okay? So let me put up, uh, uh, let me run this. So to, to get a solution, I have at this stage a whole range of tools at my disposal. I could pass this to Epsol. Epsol will solve it for me, but I will not understand anything about how it did it, okay? Whereas if I call bisect, then I have to give it the name of the function, which is stored in a file called flash.m, which you can see on the left, okay? So I, bisect will call flash, and then I need to provide two initial guesses to it. So I'm going to give 0 and 1, okay? And then I need to give a tolerance, that is how accurate I want the results to be, e minus 10. For example, I want 10 significant digits. And then I will put one for the last parameter, which is print out at every iteration. As you make better guesses, print out so that I know how the iteration proceeds, okay? So it took about 30 iterations to get me the result to 10 significant digits, okay? And the answer is written return. That is the value of psi that will make the rice rashford equation equal to zero. That's where the solution is. That is the fraction of phi that is in the vapor. About 4.3 percent goes to the vapor. The remaining goes to the liquid phase. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it took 30 iterations. Okay. And what it is printing, how do you know? Well, let me show you the bisect function. And let's see whether you can. We have seen this before. <coughs> That's taking an unusually long time. Okay, this is the function that we wrote, okay? It is in the textbook and I will put it onto the model so that you can download and change it if you like, okay? So here, the place that we are printing this out is here. If trace is true, print that, okay? So that prints out in the first position, the iteration number i. In the second position, the next guess x3. Given two guesses, x1, x2, it takes the next guess as the average of x1 and x2. That is done in line 22 that you see here, okay? <clears throat> and then f3, what is the function value at the position, okay? So if you look at the MATLAB window, you will find that the function value is decreased, but very slowly. The first guess, is, the first better guess is between 0 and 1 is 0.5. At that point, the function is minus 0.30, not 0. So it will continue until the function is given to less than 10 to the minus 10, because that's what we specified as the tolerance. Any questions? So do you understand the idea of convergence? What we mean by convergence? Convergence is approaching the solution. Okay, so this is called an iterative process. You make your guesses and you devise a scheme that gets better and better guesses, and the sequence should converge. It may not always converge, but bisection method, we say, is guaranteed to converge. Why is it guaranteed to converge? Those are the questions you should be able to discuss in an exam, okay? I will ask you to compare and contrast second with bisection. Bisection, we make the claim that it is guaranteed to converge simply because we always bracket the root. We always check whether the signs are, are opposite, okay? If you have two guesses, F, x1 and x2, you calculate f1 and f2, and if they are positive and negative, then you know that there is a place where it crosses. So it is guaranteed to converge. In uh, regular false method also, we do the check, okay? And so it is also guaranteed to converge. Okay, so if you want to use this with regular false method, all you need to do is change, what do we call it? R-E-G-F-A-L. That's the name of the function that I have given. It didn't converge after 10, after 100 iterations, okay? These are the kind of things you should be prepared. When you are solving a real chemical engineering problem, whether you use HiSys or MATLAB or any other tool, you might encounter a situation like this. Now, is this answer wrong? Shouldn't that be like less, less number of iterations for I which one to <laughs> That's a very good observation. So you remember one of the things that we stated earlier that because the regular pulse method puts a straight line, 
it is going to reach the solution quicker than the bisection method. But what you are seeing here is it is not happening. <coughs> okay, and uh, so that depends on the initial guesses. If I change the initial guess, you might find that it does better. So it depends basically on where your root is in compar comparison to the initial guesses. But the first thing that you should realize when you see something like this is it is not. We, we cannot say that it is not converged. It is converged, but the answer is not accurate to <coughs> ten decimal places. Okay, so you may not want a ten decimal place accuracy. You may want only three decimal places. Okay, so if I go and change this to ten to the minus three, then it does it in three iterations. Okay, but you might say, oh no, this is too much of an error. So I do want to refine this bit more. Okay, so the control that you have is the tolerance. Okay, so I might change it to five. It's it's a better answer. Okay, so. In every good program, you will have a maximum limit because you don't want this to be an endless loop. Okay, the for loop can be going on forever uh, if it cannot meet the uh, convergence tolerance. Okay, so the key concept that you should know is what is an iterative method? What do we mean by convergence? How do we assess whether the thing is converged or not? So just because uh, regular false says that it did not converge in under iterations. It, it is still a valid answer because accuracy is not 10, but maybe it's eight, eight significant digits. Okay, we will see other methods that will converge much faster than this. <coughs> now there is a method called secant method. Uh, let me go to the notes. Now here I'm putting a. A piece of code that creates a uniformly spaced data points on the x axis and calculates what is the function value on the y axis and plots them. Okay, so from there you can see that if you draw a horizontal line here, you will see that somewhere here it will cut the curve. So that is where the actual solution psi is, that is where the function is equal to 0. Okay, that happens to be about 0 0.04 uh, if you come down. Okay, that's what we are looking for. So this function is very shallow, very horizontal in that region. And that's why if you are drawing a straight line between this and this, the straight line is going to have need much more iterations than a bisection method. So they both approximately require the same amount of iteration, same amount of computational effort. There is a method called secant method. <coughs> So this is the graph also idea. The key idea here you should be able to derive in an exam. Okay. So if I say derive the updating scheme, the new, how do you improve your two guesses x1 and x2 in the bisection method, in the regular false method, in the second method, you should be able to do this. You should be able to show what is the idea behind it. The idea is we have two data points and we put a straight line through that and we ask the question where does that straight line intersect, the x-axis. We say that is a better guess than either x1 or x2. And if you repeat that process, it will converge to the root, which is actually here. Okay. <clears throat> now, in, second, in the regular false method, we always check in discarding after you have found out x3, we are going to keep only two. We are going to discard. So, in this case, we will discard x1 and f1 because it's outside the root is between x3 and x2. So, we will rename them as x2 and x1 and continue the process. Okay, That's what guarantees you convergence because in both bisection and regular function method, you are always checking whether you are on either side and keeping only those two roots, uh, those two guesses for the root. Okay, Whereas in the second method, you make a drastic change. You say, I don't care whether I have a root that is bracket, the, uh, two guesses that are bracketing a root, I just keep the two most recent values. I discard the oldest value. Okay. <laughs> so if I'm labeling them as x1, x2, x3, I will discard x1. I'll keep x2 and x3. Okay, that is the so this is the linear interpolation formula which gives you the updating rule. The updating rule remains the same. The equation remains the same for both secant and regular false method. Okay, it's the same. 
the key difference is in the second method, you keep the last two values, x2 and x3, and discard x1. <coughs> Do I have a graph of that? So we only get, we only get x1 and x2, right? You will be able to get, even though you are not always checking to keep only the two values that are on either side of the root, it will still converge. The second method will still converge, but it is not guaranteed to converge. Okay? Sometimes it may blow up. And we need to understand when it will blow up and what are the reasons for which uh, it will blow up. Okay? So the key change is two most recent values are kept. The formula is the same as before for calculating x3. It's a linear equation and you ask the question, where does it intersect? But as you see in this figure, if you are using regular Falsai method, you will keep x1 and x3 because the roots are on, uh, the gases are on either side of the root. But in secant method, you will throw this away. You will take only 2 and 3. And you will draw a straight line connecting those two and ask the question, where does it intersect? I'm going to pause now and ask you to think about, okay? What are the, what could be the potential problems when I string the strategy to this? Instead of keeping, checking every time and keeping that uh, two values that are either side of the root, which guarantees me convergence, I just keep the last two values. And here I have a sketch of it. When I do the last two values and put a straight line, the straight line goes like this. It's actually farther away from the, uh, from the root, right? What kind of problems can I get? get? Can anybody guess? <clears throat> Absolute silence means I have not been <laughs> getting the idea of, uh, across. <clears throat> you want me to repeat? How are we doing so far? Have you been following whatever I have been saying? Okay. So the simple change in rule that we make is instead of keeping two values that are on either side of the rule, I am keeping only the last two values, what I call the last two values. So, the so there is no rule between x2 and x3. Okay, <coughs> but I'm going to connect x2 and x3 to x10, and here I have the third guess, which is going to be the better guess in, uh, in this algorithm, and I'll keep that 3 and 2. I'll continue like this, and you'll find that when it converges, it converges faster than bisection method, but it is not guaranteed to converge. So my question is, what kind of problem can it occur can conceptually, pictorial in your mind? Why would it not converge? Why is it not guaranteed to converge? Of course, why is it not guaranteed to converge? Because we are not enforcing it. We are not checking. We are not keeping the two values that are on either side. But <clears throat> maybe let me give you a, a hint. Suppose I have a function that looks like this. Okay, <coughs> and my f2 and uh, or f1 and f2 turn out to be these. Remember, they don't have to be on either side. We're not checking, right? So both f1 and f2 can be on the same side. So if I have something like this, what would happen? And I'm trying to connect these and ask the question, where does that intersect then? x-axis, right? That's my going to be my be next best guess. Where would it meet? It will never meet, okay? What kind of a problem will I have in the equation? The equation I have this. So I have f2 minus f1. So in f2 and f1 are the same, what happens to that problem? You get it divide by zero. That's what causes the x3 to be becoming larger and larger. So if the difference between f1 and f2 becomes smaller and smaller, this number becomes larger and larger. That means x3 is going to go farther and farther away from the two guesses that we have. Okay? So this can very easily create a divergence. That's what we would call a divergence. So when it updates this, it can blow up very easily, but when it converges, it converges also very quickly. Okay? <coughs> How do people come up with these schemes? By playing with them, by thinking about them, by trial and error. Okay, so these are all incremental improvements in the ideas that led up to FSOL. FSOL uses a very sophisticated version of combination of a lot of these ideas. Okay, 
Any questions on that? So the thing, important thing that you need to know about secant method is it is not guaranteed to converge. And what happens is when the two guesses, particularly if a function has a maxima or a minima, when the two guesses are approximately at the same level in the function value, you get a potential divide by zero. That makes a number large, which makes the next guess go farther away. Geometrically, what it means is that that straight line never intersects the x-axis. So you don't have, you have a number uh, that keeps on growing to infinity, okay? That is what we would call divergence. Not what we experienced in the previous problem where you just failed to meet the criterion, but it still gave you a good result with six, seven significant digits. Whereas a blow up would mean it goes to infinity. And we will see examples of these uh, in the simulation. Now, <coughs> uh, what should I do? Should I show you the second method? How many of you at this stage understand the second method enough to go and change the regular false scheme to the second method? If I give you the code for the regular false method, very few change you need to make to be able to make it work for second method. I guess I don't have that code. Um, maybe I have it in MATLAB. <coughs> this is bisect. So we we took bisect and made one change to produce an algorithm called the regular false scheme. And that one change was in line 22. Some of you immediately pointed that out last, last time, right? Where x3 equals x1 plus x2 divided by 2 was the bisect method. We said that's no longer true, so we replaced it by the linear interpolation. That is going to remain the same when it take the regular false scheme and change it into the second method. What will change? Which line will change? First identify that, and then we will see how we will, we will change it. If you understood the idea, what we are trying to do in second method, and understand this code, you should be able to point out which line it should change. Exactly, line 25. Okay. So this is where we are checking whether the two function values are on either side of the root. If there is a sign change, and then we say we take x3, the new value, Put it either into x2 or take x3 and put it into x1, depending on which two values are on either side of the group. That is what the bisection and regular false sign method require. So, how will I change it? I will not check for sign, right? Sign change. So, what all I should do is take, <coughs> I have now x1, x2, x3, right? I have three three values x1, x2 are the guesses that came in, and x3 is all the way calculated here. Okay. So what I need to do is take take x2 and x3 and relabel them as x1 and x2. Okay. So take x2, put it into x1, take x3 and put it into x2, and then complete the loop. So the loop will just keep going. Okay. Do you understand that? <coughs> So how does that code look? So I, I threw that conditional check, and I said take x2, put it in x1, take f2 and put it into f1, take x3, put it into x2, and f1. And then f2. <coughs> okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Could I have done this? <coughs> X1 equals X2. Uh, Instead of line 22, could I have done this? So I have x3 and put it into x2, and I have x2 which I put into x1. <coughs> exactly. So the order is very important. Okay. So what you are doing here is taking x3 and putting it into x2. So x2 has been 
the limit of the old value x2, the variable location x2, contains the value that was in x3. So then you're taking that x2 and putting it into x1. So both x1 and x2 will have the same value. Even though logically it looks like you are replacing uh, x3 with x2 and x2 with x1, what will happen in the computer is both x1 and x2 will have the same value. Okay, so the order is important. You should first replace <coughs> take x2 and put it into x1. So you're saving x2 into x1 and then x2 is free to be replaced. Then you take x3 and put it into x2. Okay. So that particular order is uh, important to no notice there. The rest are basically the same as in the previous team. Okay. Any questions on that? We are basically slowly building up, building on the idea how to improve and uh, uh, we'll see uh, whether there are any differences in the algorithm. These three algorithms are very similar in their convergence characteristics. Okay. So let's try uh, second. <coughs> for the same guesses. Okay. For the same guess, second converged in three iterations, plus or minus five. Whereas the regular ones I took about 13 iterations. Now these are all of the order of microseconds, so you really don't care whether it took three iterations or 13 iterations, right? But it is a progression of idea that is important. How we build more sophisticated algorithms because any computer simulation software that you will use for engineering underlying that these algorithms are there it's for solving algebraic equations, for solving differential equations, etc. Okay, <coughs> any questions? Yeah, uh, like, you that, would, would, you have to, would you have to check to see if, I guess, why would you have to check to see your bracket? Say, did you have a picture here? Right. It doesn't check for that. That is the deliberate design that people did when they went. Otherwise, it will be called regular false A scheme, right? Because they are the same in terms of replacing x3. They use the same uh, concept of a line, two through points, and where they intersect. But deliberately, they said, what would happen if I don't enforce that they should bracket? The price you pay is it is not guaranteed to converge. It will blow up. It is likely to blow up. Okay, but when it converges, as you saw here, it converges in three iterations compared to thirteen iterations by the regular false method. Okay, <coughs> those are the subtle points that I, I want you to be able to uh, respond in an exam. Okay, what are the differences between various algorithms in terms of implementation and in terms of performance? Okay, any other questions? So the next algorithm is one of the most widely used one developed by Newton. So it's called the Newton method. And the idea also is still the same that we are going to take, <clears throat> I have a few other examples where for example they change K1 to be a different value and then that will, what would happen? Let me ask you, if I have a same four component system but instead of K1 being 2, I have K1 is equal to 5. What would happen to the value of psi? For that, to answer that, you should be now a chemical engineer. You should understand what is the k value. What does the k value represent? Remember the equation for k, yi equal to ki xi. Or you can look at ki as equal to yi divided by xi. So if k is large, what does it mean? It's more volatile. It, it, it likes to be in the vapor state. So the composition in the vapor phase will be much more than in the liquid phase. So you are, it will be easier to separate that mixture. If you have one component that has a very high K value, another component that has a very low K value, it's very easy to separate them. But it's very difficult to separate those mixtures that have very closely uh, spaced K values. For example, if you want to uh, separate heavy water from water. Okay, what is the difference between heavy water and water? You guys know about heavy water or? If you don't, you have to put up and ask, okay? I just throw these things at you and if you're quiet, I won't know. So heavy water is the one that is used in uh, nuclear reactors for mod as a moderator. It is, instead of water contains hydrogen H2O, right? 
the heavy water contains deuterium with oxygen instead of H2O is D2O. So the differences in properties are extremely small. Okay, and heavy water is needed in nuclear reactors. So there are separators that chemical engineers design. Okay. In fact, these nuclear reaction things became possible because chemical engineers played a very key role in separation of uranium. Okay, there is only a particular type of uranium that will uh, participate in the nuclear reaction, okay, in the uh, <coughs> fission reaction. So you need to be able to separate an isotope. And these are, we are exploiting the differences in properties, properties in diffusivity, properties in volatility, solubility, and things like that. So in the case of water and heavy water, K values would be very closely spaced. So you will see that you will end up needing hundreds of stages to achieve even a small separation. Whereas with methane and pentane, you will find a very large separation in K values, so those are easy to separate, okay. So a flash drum is normally used in those cases where it's easy to separate. You're trying to get the vapor and the liquid in, in one stage in, in a sense. So my question to you is, with that physical understanding, if I increase K, K1, everything else remains the same. K1 uh, from 2 to 5, what would you expect? How would you expect the psi to change? When K was this set of numbers, 2, 1.5, 0.5, and 0.1, we saw that <coughs> psi value was 0 0.0434. I want you to wager a bet. Is it going to go up or down when I change K1 to 5? Up. Anybody for down? Good intuition, right? So we're making that material more volatile, so the vapor fraction of that should be more in the vapor phase. And how much, suppose I ask you this question, find me the amount of component one that goes to the top. How would you answer that question? Now I know what is the vapor fraction, right? So this simply tells me that if I have 100 moles per hour of feed entering the flash drum, 38.45 moles is going to go to the top, the remaining is going to go to the bottom. That's what this one tells me, right? So now I want you to tell me I have equimolar mixture, that is 0.25 mole fraction of the four components, methane, ethane, propane, and butane, for example. What fraction of methane will go to the top? Okay, how would I answer that question? <clears throat> Pardon me? Yeah, what, well, there are two questions that I can ask. How much of the meth methane will go to the top? What will be the mole fraction of methane in the top? And what fraction of methane goes to the top? The, uh, well, it depends on the ratio of K values, but we have used that already to find the total vapor fraction that goes to the top. So if you look at our model, let me just try to get to there. The model had a complete set of equations. And we have used only one part of it. You, you, you need to. <coughs> this was the equation we saw. with one equation in one unknown. That gave us the total fraction of feed that goes to the vapor. Okay? But once you have that sign, you know the heat composition of the molar K value. So if you plug these numbers into here, what does it give you? It gives you the mole fraction of each one of those four components that goes to the liquid. And then take that and plug it in here, you get the mole fraction of each component that goes to the vapor. So let us answer this question. Make sure that you are able to do that. Question is, what fraction of the methane, so let's call them as methane, ethane, propane, butane, four components. What fraction of the methane goes to the top is the question. How do I answer that question from the answer that I have so far? Okay. <clears throat> I need to switch between MATLAB and this. See whether I can have both equations at the same time. Oops. My computer is finicky today. So you need to look at that equation. Okay. So how would I write an expression in MATLAB to calculate xi and then yi? Okay, I'm going to write this, and if I, I make deliberately some mistakes, I want you to catch, okay? So I'm going to try to implement this one, because this is the equation 
that tells me what is the work factor in the liquid from each one of those comp compositions, knowing the sign of it. Okay? <coughs> so let me first uh, store the answer. Uh, so all I'm saying is that the fraction psi is safe, that's 0.3845. So <coughs> x is going to be equal to, uh, where is that formula, z divided by psi k or minus psi, psi times k. Yeah, psi times k plus 1 minus psi. How many of you agree that it will give me the, how many numbers do I expect? Four numbers. These are the mole fractions of methane, ethane, propane, butane in the liquid phase. Will it give me the right answer? <coughs> what did it do? I expected four numbers. It gives me one number. <laughs> it does a matrix division. Very good. You want an element by element division. Okay. So you call this back and say, I want Z divided element by element. So the numerator is a vector and the denominator is also going to be a vector. But where does the vector enter? Here it is a scalar multiplied by a vector. So the result will be a vector. That's like adding that was okay. <laughs> so that should give me four numbers. Okay. So some MATLAB form. What should that be? Right. Okay. And how do I calculate Y? Would that work? You again need a element by element multiplication. So now you have the mole fraction of each one of these components in the vapor phase and mole fraction of each one of these in the liquid phase. What was the question that we asked? We asked what fraction of methane goes to the vapor. So how would you evaluate that? This is a chemical engineering question. You should be experts at this by now. You've done a mass energy balance course, right? How would I calculate what fraction of the methane in the feed that goes to the top? Okay, so how would you calculate the total moles of methane that is going into the top stream and the what is the total number of moles entering the feed stream? How would you calculate that? It's the flow rate times the mole fraction of methane in that. So if I take one mole per hour entering, F is one, okay, so what would be the amount en entering? <clears throat> so in the feed, F times Z1 is 0.25. So I'm assuming that I have, I'm using my basis as one mole. If I have one mole entering, then one mole times 0.25 is so many moles per hour of methane that is entering. Okay. So of this, I'm asking what fraction goes to the top. Okay. So what would that be? If one mole is entering, how many moles are going to the vapor phase? Psi. Psi is the fraction of feed that is going to the vapor, right? So psi is the vapor fra fraction. So if one mole is entering, 38 percent, 0.38 moles are going to the vapor. What should I multiply this by to get the amount of methane entering? Say it again. Feed, what is feed? I'm on a feed. No, no. I'm, I'm asking you to calculate. Remember, I think I need to probably go slow here. Okay. So this is the sketch and I have V, I have YI, I have L, I have XI. Okay. And I have F and ZI. ZI is 0.25 for all of them. F is 1. I'm telling you that F is 1. So what is V in this particular problem that we did just now? Not 0 0.25, 0 0.3845, that is the fraction of the feed that goes to the vapor. 
The definition for psi is V over F. Remember that, okay? So the definition for psi is, it's a fraction of feed that goes to the vapor. So if the feed is 1, what is V? 0.38, okay? If that is 0.38, we already know what Yi is. What is the amount of methane that is going there? It is 0.38 times Yi. Okay, that's going to be 0.38 times whatever the Y1 was. Okay, that is the amount of methane that is going to the top. So my question was, what fraction goes to the top? So how do you get that fraction? It's going to be simply 0.38 times Yi divided by, complete that, 0.25. If any of this doesn't make sense, how many of you, I mean, if it doesn't make sense to you, please put up your hand. Or is it too trivial? <laughs> That's not an extreme. <laughs> right? So you should be able to answer. The purpose of doing all this is to be able to do process analysis. Right? So build a model, get a solution from the computer, and start analyzing it, answering questions like this. What fraction does it go to the top? And the next question may be, I want to find out, okay, I want 45%, whatever not the number that comes out here, I want a definite percentage to go to the top. How can I tweak my operation? How can I change the K values? How can I change the temperature, pressure to achieve that target? Okay? That is the purpose of process design and process analysis. So you should be able to do that. So in this particular case, to answer that question in MATLAB session, what I will do is I will simply put uh, psi times Y1 divided by <coughs> uh, Z1 times 1, because feed is 1, okay? So 75% of the methane in the feed goes to the top, okay? That would be the answer for that particular question, okay? Um, okay, so let's move on to the next method, and that method is the Newton method. Okay. What is the basic idea behind the Newton method? So, as I said, it's a progression of ideas. So, in the second method, we made two guesses. We put a straight line through that, which is a chord connecting those two points, which is supposed to be an approximation for the function. In the Newton method, we say, <coughs> we don't need two guesses. Just give me one guess. But I should be able to take the derivative of that function at that point. So, you give me x1. I can calculate f1 because I have the function. I can plug in the value of x1, calculate f1. But I should also be able to calculate f1 prime, the derivative, which is a tangent. Okay? And then ask the question, where does the tangent intersect the x-axis? That is going to be a better approximation, x2, than the one that I have given. Okay? The basic area is very simple to understand graphically. Instead of making two guesses, putting a chord through that, and asking the question, where does the chord cut the x-axis? Give me only one point, but give me the ability to take the derivative of the function. That's very important. Okay? Then I will take the derivative, and I draw a tangent to that. I can calculate the slope. The slope is the derivative. If I know the derivative, I evaluate the derivative at that point. So I can construct an equation for the tangent line. And then ask the question, where does the tangent line intersect the x-axis? And that becomes my better guess. Okay? So instead of treating this curve, I'm saying that curve is approximated by the straight line. So the curve intersects here, which is my true value of the root, but the approximation cuts here. Then I take that as my next guess, and I draw a tangent to that. And you can see that tangent goes, in this particular case, almost close to it. So Newton method really converges much, much faster than any of the methods that we have seen. We, see that, we say that it is quadratically convergent, and we will see what it means later on. But the concept has to be translated into a mathematical equation, which we can use to replace the next guess in our algorithm. So that is what is done here. Okay. So what we are doing is, what is the slope? I can calculate the slope. The left-hand side is known independently. If you give me the function, I take its derivative, and I evaluate the derivative at the guessed value, so I know f prime. But f prime is also given by, if you take these two points, the slope of uh, 
<coughs> rise over run, it's going to be 0 minus F1, which is this vertical line, which is what you see in the numerator, divided by X2 minus X1. Geometrically, you can see that the slope, which you know already, is given by X2. But I am setting this equal to 0 because <coughs> at this point, the function is 0. Okay? And I'm going to solve in this particular equation, you give me the guess for X1. I calculate F1. So I know F1. But I also calculate F1 prime. At the same point, I calculate its slope. So the only unknown in that equation becomes X2. So I rewrite the equation for X2. So everything on the right hand side is known. X1 is the guess that I make. And I calculate the function and its derivative. So that's a penalty I pay. I need to calculate the function and its derivative. So instead of making two guesses, I make only one guess, but at that guess, I calculate both the function and its derivative. And then I get a new value for a guess, x2. And then I put a loop around that, checking for convergence at every iteration. Any questions on that? Newton's method, have you seen in any other courses before? Have you used it? You did? Okay. <coughs> What if the line doesn't cross the axis? Yeah, a question, a very good question. What happens if the line doesn't cross the x-axis? When would that happen? When there is a maxima or a minima. Okay. So if I have a function that does this, and my guess happens to be here, I calculate the function, and I calculate its derivative. The derivative is 0. So I get a divide by 0. So it suffers the same problem as second method does. It is not guaranteed to converge. Okay? But it can, when it converges, it converges faster than the second method. Okay? And we say that it converges quadratically, mathematically. And we will see what it means. And this is the Newton method. <coughs> Guess. Now you understood the Newton method. You understood what needs to be done. You, you accept one input, yes, but you calculate the function and its derivative analytically and then devise a method for updating it. So what would the first four inputs or five inputs be here? What would this one be? The function itself. Okay. The second one is something called a Jacobian. It is the derivative of the function. Okay. In the one-dimensional case, it is simply df dx, where f of x equal to 0 is the function. Okay. So the second argument is a function which will take the guess and return the derivative. But when you have multi-dimensional case, which we are going to see in the next class, that Jacobian would be a matrix okay. because you will have many equations and many unknowns. There are many possible derivatives that you need to take. What would be the third one? A guess. Fourth one is your error criterion. Fifth one is printing out a every iteration, a trace option that you want to put in. Okay. So we are basically taking the previous algorithm and changing a few things. The most important change is the ability to calculate the derivative. You need to write a function for that. Okay. So I want you to study. So I am kind of not going through line by line because it's built on the previous ones, but you, every one of you should be able to decipher this. So I might take this algorithm, put an error there and say find out, just to make sure that you are able to do this. Okay? <coughs> but uh, in this function, I have put in a maximum limit on how many times Newton method should work. What would that number be? I'm looking at that. Can you guess? So 25. So if the cloud is less than 25, it's a while. Okay? It's 25, and the cloud, the error is greater than the cloud. Just keep doing it. But if you have attempted 25 times and the uh, error is not less than 100, then you give up and put an error message. Okay? You can change those numbers easily, but you need to know what is the function of each one of these. And here I am making a call to the function with a guess x, and I get back my function value. Here I make another call 
to the function called JAC Jacobian, which gives me back the derivative of the function, and I store that in J. And here I have x equals the previous guess minus j backslash f. This is the equation that I derived just now from a single straight line. Okay, You must be able to recognize that that line that you see, x equals x minus j f, this line okay, is the same as the one that we derived graphically. Okay, x equals x minus f1 divided by f1 prime. So in MATLAB syntax, what we are saying this is x equal to x minus j backslash uh, f. Okay, so j could be a matrix. Yeah. Do you have um, files? Do you have a I'm going to show you for the flash function. How do I implement the flash solver with Newton method? You need to be able to do that. Right. I'll show you that. And that will kind of nail it down what exactly happens. Okay, so the rest are all fairly straightforward checks. Okay, you are incrementing the counter, and uh, if chase is enabled, you're printing the iteration count, and then if it is uh, exceeded, you just say maximum number of iteration exceeded and give up. Okay. <coughs> So it's a fairly simple algorithm, the generalization of the second method, but you need to provide two functions. So how, do, how would I do that for the flash problem? You should be able to do it for any problem. Okay? In the second exam, I will give you more complicated nonlinear equations. You should be able to assemble the Jacobian and uh, write, uh, identify, not write the function, but identify the Jacobian structure. Okay? So let me show you. We already seen the flash function. Okay, this is the flash function which takes a guess for sign and returns the function values. Now, your question was how does the Jacobian look like? How does the derivative look like? Uh, no, that's not the one I want. That's a driver that calls both. Let me just see. It's called B flash. So this is the main difference between the previous algorithm. So this is now calculating the derivative of the flash function. Before you can do that, you should be able to take the derivative analytically. Okay, you should go to the paper and write down what the derivative of the function is. Then you can come back and make sure that it makes sense. Okay, so what is this expression? You should be able to derive that. That is the derivative of the given function with respect to the variable. Okay. So let's go back before we come to analyze this. Do you, this is what you are asking, right? So let's make sure that we are able to derive what is in this line. Okay. What is in this line? You should be able to derive on a piece of paper before you can code that. So how would I do that? Um, Sorry, <laughs> my apologies. So this is the function. How many of you can take a piece of paper and take its derivative? Take a minute, two minutes. Take the derivative of that function with respect to psi, and then we will do it and see whether your calculus is still sharp. <laughs> Army? Yeah, yeah. Chain what is the derivative of function of u over v? Something like that. But it has to be applied to, there's a summation there. Hmm? The derivative is with respect to psi. So when you're taking the derivative, you're going to keep a and z as constants. So it's a partial derivative of the function with respect to the unknown. So all the parameters are treated as constants. They are known. Okay. <laughs> So this is the thing you should be able to do in an exam for a given problem. It may not be a multi-component flash. It may be a reactor problem, okay, or it may be a phase behavior problem with the equation of state, whatever flow problem, for example. Okay, there are a number of these examples in the text that you should be able to study, and for each one you should be able to take the derivative of the function. So 
You guys want to give it a try? Or? How many of you can take the derivative? Can. Only few are confident. <laughs> okay, let's do, take the derivative. So I want df with respect to d sub. Okay? So what happens to the summation? The summation will stay as it is because when you are expanding the summation, you're going to have four terms, for example, in the four component system. You need to take the derivative of each one of those terms, but they will have the same form. So the summation stays as such, and then you will have <coughs> uh, do you know the formula? U over V, the denominator Ki minus 1 psi plus 1 square, right? And then <coughs> you go to the numerator. The, basically what you want is something like d of u over v. Okay, it is v squared, v du minus u dv. My computer is really very slow today. That's the formula that you need to remember. In an exam, if you think you would have problems with this, you just let, need to let me know. I'll add a formula sheet and I will add these things that you need. Okay? I don't, this is not a, a course about memorizing things, but recognizing what needs to be done and doing it. Yeah, so you could say, for example, that uh, this one is zero. There is no variation in the numerator. Then it, this is a more general one you can handle, but it should be able to handle the specialized case. The specialized case would be simply minus 1 over that square, and then you add up by the chain rule, right? That's, that's true. So you can have minus uh, 1 minus ki zi. It's really slow. And then what goes in there is the derivative of the denominator, because it's a chain rule, right? Derivative of the denominator with respect to sine. So what does that be? Ki minus, minus 1. Okay, so it is that line that you need to code which will take in Ki and Zi as input parameters and the guess psi and then calculate the derivative and return that, including the summation term. Okay, so this part is the important thing in your ability to implement the Newton method, which I will expect you to be able to do in an exam for a given problem. <laughs> okay, now that you have it, you can go and compare uh, term by term. Assuming that there is no error in this one, I should be able to explain what I see here. Okay, so I have a summation, okay, and then I have k minus 1 squared. Okay, 1 minus k, k minus 1. So what I did is I flipped the sign of one of them and wrote both of them as k and minus 1. Okay? So I have k minus 1 dot exponent that says do term by term. Okay, it's a term by term exponentiation. And then a division dot the y. And in the denominator I have 1 plus uh, k minus 1 times psi. Again dot square because it's a square there. Okay, so that is a simple implementation of... Uh, that derivative. But what it does is you can pass many values of psi, many guesses, and it will calculate the derivative of each one of them. I really don't need that for Newton method because all I need is one guess. But because my original function was written for a range of guesses, I just cut and paste and I kept the same thing. So it has the same ability to calculate the derivative for a number of guesses that you provide. So, these are the two functions that you need to write in a Newton method. The original function and its derivative. And in order to do that, you need to uh, find the derivative. Now, in your calculus course, have you been introduced to MathCAD, Mathematica, Maple, any of those tools? Very good. Mathematica. All of them will help you in taking the derivative analytically of functions that you throw at it. Okay? MATLAB also has a toolbox that is connected to Maple. So there is a function called DIFF, which will take the derivative of 
any function that you can throw at it analytically, okay. And later on we will see how to use that. But I am just making you aware that these tools are available as the function gets more complicated uh, to help you in taking the derivative. So, how do I use it now, okay. How would I use it? I would say Newton which is the name of the function at flash which is the name of the function that I want to solve, d flash which is the name of the derivative that I want to solve. What would I put next? A guess, okay. Let me say 0 0.5 and then I had a tolerance minus 10 and then the trace. This is how I would use. So, I have an algorithm that takes the function and its derivative, an initial guess, a tolerance and then tries to solve it. And um, so, the interaction between the algorithm and the function is very similar to what we have seen before, <coughs> okay. So, the Newton method converged in four iterations and I said that it converges quadratically, okay. The key signature of a Newton method is if you look at the error, the residual, the function value, if it is 10 to the minus 1 for example, next time it should be square of that 10 to the minus 2. Next time it should be square of that 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 16. So, it just uh, squares itself, the error goes down quadratically okay, as an error to the power 2. That is what you see here 1 to 3, 3 to 6, 6 to 12. If it does not do that you have an error either in the function or the derivative because it is a property of Newton method that it converges quadratically. The other methods that we have seen so far have only a linear convergence. What does linear convergence mean? If the error is 10 to the minus 1, next time it will be 10 to the minus 2, next time it will be 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, etc. It converges much more slowly compared to the Newton method, okay. That is what we mean when we say that it converges quadratically. You can see the result here in the in that um, expression. It error goes down a square of the previous error. Any questions? Was the pace okay this lecture or did I go faster? Okay. All right. <coughs> um, I will put up all these functions by section sec and into MATLAB into Moodle, study them. And the next class we will generalize this to multivariable case systems of equations. Okay. You can pick up your exam.